Hello, everybody. Um, very glad to see you, and um, welcome to a Catalyst Conversation at CIC. I'm Deborah Davidson, director and founder of Catalyst Conversations. I want to thank Venture Cafe CIC for hosting us this for hosting this program, and I especially want to thank Alex Chung for his interest in including us in this Thinking Outside the Box Venture Cafe. What happens at CIC exemplifies creativity. I want to also thank the Mass Cultural Council for a recent grant, our board, and all our volunteers who help us out, and to those of you who have donated. We were founded to open a critical path for dialogue between the arts and sciences over 10 years ago. We present intimate and provocative conversations between artists, scientists, and the public. And we're interested in connecting the two through programs, educational outreach, and public events like this, which demonstrate the important conversation and synergy between art, science, and technology. This program, Ideators in Conversation, Art and Social Practice, focuses on ideas of what inspires and provokes artists to create their unique and innovative work and how those ideas can extend beyond the singular studio practice. I'm pleased to be doing so with Mary Sherman, artist and founder of Transcultural Exchange. As expressed in the TCE website, inclusivity exchange, excuse me, inclusivity diversity, these are more than just words to us. They are who we are, transcultural exchange. For more than 30 years, our mission has been to foster a greater understanding of world cultures through large-scale global art projects, cultural exchange, and educational programming, most notably our International Conference on Opportunities in the Arts. To start, we're going to each do a brief presentation, and then we'll sit down and have a conversation. And of course, you're welcome to join us towards the end of the hour. So I will start, and then Mary will follow. So what I'm showing you is um, a very uh, brief selection of programs that we've done over the past uh, more than 10 years. I think we've had about 100 speakers. And I chose some, uh, some that I particularly like. Um, so I, I, I believe that both Mary and I will reveal ourselves as makers and organizers. And we're imitating a Picha Kucha style presentation, which is a very fast way of presenting ideas. Uh, and it's something that Mary uses um, during her transcultural um, conferences. So this um, first image is um, the work of Gupi Rangathan. And she was in conversation with er Erez Lieberman Aiden. This was our very first conversation. And they had worked together at the Broad Institute, where she had been an artist in residence. And Aidan said that interacting with her, science artist, uh, led him to resolving the research he was working on, helping him to see. This is an uh, image of um, Janet, work by Janet Eckelman, who was in conversation with Sam Boyer, Sam Jury, and Eli Kintage, um, engineering and science and the creative collaboration. Each artist and their respective collaborator engaged each other in a four-way conversation. Um, reading Messages in the Natural World, photographer Rosamond Purcell was paired with literary critic Sven Burkitz, channeling renowned paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould. Sm Sven read from the text of Bestiary, a book that Gould and Rosamond worked on together, interspersed with text, and Rosamond showed images and talked to her about her work as well. This is the work by Georgie Freeman, uh, Sh Friedman who's a video, uh, video installation artist. And she was in conversation with MIT hurricane specialist, Carrie Emanuel. There exists a dual perception of storms, as they are both beautiful and terrible at the same time, and invoke in us a sense of sublime. Both Georgie and Carrie navigate this territory and share their respective concerns and ideas about how storms affect us culturally, historically, and conversely, the effects of human behavior on them. Um, this is a project called Face Topo that was put together by Alberta Chu and Murray Robinson. Filmmaker Alberta Chu and researcher uh, Murray Robinson discussed the ideas that led to their collaboration, Face Topo. This project stemmed from their interest in the genetics of face and a big question 
a clear but genetically complex trait, could one's face possibly represent a visible proxy for one's genome? This is um, a piece by uh, Jeff Lieberman um, that you may be uh, familiar with. Uh, it's in the lobby of the, bi the main Biogen uh, building uh, in Kendall. Um, so he, artist physicist Jeff Lieberman, was in conversation with novelist physicist J Alan Lightman. And they talked together about a range of topics ranging from religion and science and connecting to Alan Lightman's novel turned into a play, Mr. G, which is a creation story. And again, this is his amazing installation at the Biogen building. Uh, Emily Eveleth was in conversation with David Tester as part of Hub Week. The subject matter was on beauty. The painter and Google data researcher each considered the idea of beauty in their respective practices. Emily is also an artist who makes beautiful objects and is also interested in cultural notions of beauty. Um, Natalie Mybeck and Ari Daniel um, discussed the idea of subjective data. Mybeck uses data to create woven sculptural structures, and science radio journalist Daniel uses data to tell stories about scientists and science. Um, boundaries of the possible. In a world capable of destroying itself, composer Todd Macover and evolutionary biologist Kevin Esfalt are both interested in helping our society make big and imperative changes. Macover with his crowdsourced symphony of cities and Esvalt with sculpting evolution, which invents new ways to study and influence the evolution of ecosystems. Theories, things, and creatures. This was Andrew Yang, uh, artist biologist, in conversation with Harvard biologist and butterfly curator Nancy, uh, Naomi Pierce. Um, the, uh, sorry. Um, they're both scientific and aesthetic curiosities drive their respective research and Andrew's art making. In this discussion, they explored many of their overlapping interests, among them animal perception, mutualism, and natural history collections. This Land, with photographer Laura McPhee and MIT geologist Taylor Perron, they shared their concern for the American landscape through their respective projects and discussed how they would each bring awareness to the evolution of land and landscapes. Poetry and the Ocean, uh, Robert Pinsky and Stefan Helmreich. As sea levels are rising, we are in a moment of global change and climate crisis. Our relationship to the ocean has altered dramatically and continues to do so. Poet Robert Pinsky and anthropologist Stefan Helmreich discussed, imagined, and invoked the ocean. Pinsky acting as a poetic voice, voice through his choice of poems was the hub of the conversation, and Helmreich's comments and responses as the spokes. Thinking with the body, with Miriam Simon, who had been investigating the implications of socio-technical and environmental change with the project training transhumanism, and choreographer and dance historian Jody Weber, who had been thinking about how trees communicate. They created an interactive conversation for all attendees, exploring and experiencing creativity through the intersection of science and dance. This is uh, a piece by me, just to give you a, a sense of what I do in addition to Catalyst. Um, so this is from a series called Dissipate, um, Disappear. And that's it for me. Um, Mary is next. Yep. Hi, everyone. Sorry, but um, I'm, I'm Mary Sherman, as Deborah told you, and I run an organization. I'm an artist, and I run an organization called Transcultural Exchange. And as this slide shows, Transcultural Exchange links together artists all over the world in the spirit of international harmony and exchange. And we do this by inviting the world to participate in our global projects, exchanges, and educational programming, most notably our international op conferences on opportunities in the arts. After 30 years of doing this work, here's all the places we've had projects. This all began, like all startups, with ambition, mine. I didn't want to just be a local artist. I wanted to be on the international stage. So ages ago, when two Viennese artists asked me if I wanted to do an exchange exhibition, um, with their friends, I said, absolutely, of course. Then I had to make it happen. 
So again, like most startups, I gathered together my like-minded friends when I was living in Chicago, and we all went to work. We got a space donated, held a dance party to raise funds, housed the Viennese artists, and more. And then we took the whole thing to Vienna, and our first exchange was born. And after that, while in grad school, a gallery owner let me use his gallery for a month, and I convinced other friends from various countries to do like we did in Chicago, produce our own exhibit. Later, we did the same in Seoul, then we were back in New York, and then we were asked to do the London Biennial. And for that, we convinced a bar to show our work. We made it easy for them and for us. Um, we made coaster-sized artworks like this big, and we tagged them with our website, which the bar exhibited underneath people's drinks. And then if the people were smart enough, they took away the artwork or they left it there. Um, that idea was later revived when we showed at the Brockton Fuller Art Museum. For that exhibit, we took advantage of what was then a relatively newly accessible technology, the internet, and I emailed hundreds of artists around the world. The first hundred who agreed to send me a host, 100 coaster-sized artworks, so they made little artworks, I sent them back a whole set of all the participating artists' coasters or artworks, and they showed them in a public space, and afterwards the public could take the works like we did at the bar in London. Thus, in three months, over 10,000 artworks were exhibited in over 100 spaces around the world and given away to the public for free. And although the, coaster, uh, and although the coasters I received looked to me like any other show of small artworks, when the photos started coming back from the artists, the, the project's in internationalism hit me. Here's the public display in Switzerland, which looks like Switzerland to me. <laughs> Germany, this is in a gallery. This is in India. This is in Mongolia. And in Spain, it was so nice, the artists got together, they coordinated their openings, and they made a poster. Oops, sorry. Um, I was only sad that all these artists had come together to do this remarkably generous project, but there was no lasting testimony of it. So I decided to change that. I asked artists to donate a tile to 22 sites where they were installed as the local artists saw, saw fit. This is the muse uh, museum's cafe terrace in Taiwan. So now we do have testaments of goodwill scattered around the globe. We have them in Boston, where I made a map with and put a dot where all the tiles came from. There's the tiles they were installed at a public school. There's the kids using the tiles for um, the classroom project. They were installed in the Philippines, so the artists could do whatever they wanted with the tiles, so we didn't impose our will on them. This is at the Cultural Center. This is in India. This is in South Africa at the university. This is in Vietnam. They made a sculpture. This is in Toronto outside a subway station. This is in Sarajevo. So then we were asked to participate again in the London Biennial, and um, this time by creating a satellite in Boston. So for that, like Deborah does, we brought artists together with people from different disciplines to meet one another. Then we built on the Boston, and, and that, then we built on the Boston London Biennial idea by pairing artists in different geographic locations to create a collaborative work. So they had to live in two different places and make a collaborative work. That project was called Here, There, and Everywhere, and there were dozens of artists who participated in it around the globe. Um, for another exhibit, we asked artists to dream up an artwork they would make if money and technological problems were not an issue. I made remote control shooting stars, well, a model of it. And we just kept doing projects. Then when COVID hit, we asked artists to email us an artwork, you know, an image, a video of a dance piece, music, et cetera, and with those literally hundreds of entries from artists, we created a virtual travel log around the world through art, giving the artist visibility during the shutter time and the public the solace that art offers in such difficult periods. We also did a video launch and projected that launch outdoors at, on top of, outside of the Museum of Sarajevo and here in Boston. And on top of these projects, and there are more projects, um, we started in 2007 an international conference. Oops, sorry, that was about the, uh, the Hello Project World. I'm a little slow about the slides. That's the video launch. Okay, then in 2007, we started an international conference on opportunities in the arts. This is a forum for artists to learn about programs to interact with their international peers, also to work with scientists, to work with people in other fields. And this way, it wouldn't just be us putting artists together with other artists or others. The artists could find the means to do it themselves, thus expanding our mission exponentially. 
And for one conference, we even commissioned an artwork to show on the spot where the conference took place all these, and where all these people came together around the world. It's about 150 speakers from around the world. The earth literally moved. So that laser, that's a laser going across I-90, and that actually on your phone showed the sway of the buildings. So you could see, which is true, that the, you, know, it, you could do it anywhere. But it showed that the earth moved where all those people were. Um, and then um, here's the last slide. This is uh, uh, some of our speakers. You probably recognize Lori Anderson, Michael Dukakis, Hora al is the next person, and she just opened the Sharjah Biennial, which I'm so proud of. Um, so as you can see, things clearly happen when you put artists and others together, which is why we're here tonight. And this is important. As one of our artists noted, the world suddenly becomes small, and you can see that there are still people who care. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to talk, right? Yeah, no, we're going to do chat. Um, thank you, Mary. I, I find it illuminating to, to kind of, and even for my presentation, to see like this is what we're doing, right? What we did and what we're still doing, yeah. and it's it's interesting. And kind of the idea of this of our conversation is, you know, how do individual artists like ourselves, you know, with an art practice and maybe teaching and so on, um, come up with like an idea like transcultural exchange, you know, you're the only person who's come up with that, you know. Uh, I think. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I believe. And um, I mean, there and there are other people who are interested in art and science, but there's nobody really doing quite like Catalyst does programming. And also, both of us are not um, affiliated with institutions, which um, I think gives us, you know, it's harder. You know, we both work really hard. But you know we're we're able to kind of do what we want <laughs> essentially um, because we're 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 in charge. Yes, I mean, it's our it's our show. So, um, so um, what I'd like to do is to yes. start start is uh, read the definition of ideation. Um, that's something that um, pervades all my activities. Is how does an idea become? Um, you know, how is it manifested? Wh whatever whatever that is. Um, so I'm going to read that, and then what I'd love for you, Mary, to start with is your the origin story, uh -huh. and maybe ex expounding on what you mm -hmm. showed us here. So, definition of ideation is the creative process of generating, developing, and communicating new ideas, where an idea is understood as a basic element of thought that can either be visual, concrete, or abstract. Ideation compromises all stages of a thought cycle from innovation to development to actualization, which you could, that's what startups do, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, they are the actualization. As such, it is an essential part of any creative or scientific practice. So, well, I think, I mean, I, I spoke to you about it some that I started out, and I still make art. And um, thankfully, because otherwise, I think we'd be really jealous of all the people who come to our conference and then go other places while I'm like no longer doing that. So, um, so anyway, I mean, I started because I really did want to not just be a local artist, and I had this opportunity, and then I just kept going from there. Every time someone would say, you know, uh, after we did the coaster project, the artist, and that was a little bit nuts because I had about I had 10,000 artworks in my studio. You know, they were small, but that's 10,000 boxes that also I mean, 100 boxes that had to go to the post office also mm -hmm. and be mailed to all these places so all those custom slips had to be filled out. So anyway, and, uh, and that was you alone. Yeah, yeah, well, no, two of us went to the post yeah. office together, <laughs> and we had, they gave us a card, and you know, we everyone got angry with us, you know, because this line was backing up. But anyway, you know, and then afterwards, the artist said, "What can we do next?" And I was like. Are you kidding? You know, <laughs> I'm like, you know, kind of my life. But then I was actually at MIT as an artist in residence, and um, we were using a laser jet cutter. And um, so I thought, well, and, I, and, I, and they were using a laser jet cutter to cut tiles. And I thought, what could we do next? All cultures have tiles, so this would make it universal. Why don't I ask the artist to make tiles? And so, so one thing always led to another. But mm. how did you get started? <laughs> so. Um, I was noticing, and I've been in the Boston area for a long time, um, I was noticing how many artists were mentioning that they're like looking at like biology or they're thinking about physics. It was just, I just found it kind of fascinating. And um, I literally ran into uh, Clara Wainwright, who people from the area might know. She's um, a um, quilt artist. But she also has been doing social practice before it was kind of uh, popular to do so. 
and she invented First Night. She had that idea, and anyway, she's, she, I ran into her and was chatting her, with her about this idea, and she said, you know, would, wouldn't it be great if there was like a TED Talk kind of format for artists in Boston? So she said, let's have lunch. And uh, I did have lunch with her, and um, she kind of mentored me and helped me kind of visualize this idea. I mean, oh. I had it was sort of, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just like Clara said, do this. You know, I did it. So, um, and it, that was about a, a year of preparation, meeting people, having lunch with people, asking people their opinion, um, including uh, the who, someone I admire so much, um, Alan Lightman. I don't know if people know who he is. Um, he was in conversation with Jeff Lieberman. He's a novelist and physicist, and I had um, someone told me I could get in touch with him. I had to write a letter, which I did on paper, and mailed to him. And anyway, he, he uh, agreed to meet me and approved of the idea. And he, he said something to me which was like amazing. He said, after our very wonderful conversation, yes, I think we need this. This is a good idea. And as I was leaving, he said, Deborah, you're doing God's work. <laughs> so I thought, OK. That's a big responsibility, <laughs> and um, I have to do this now. So I still was like, you know, okay, how do you, you know, email people? So the first slide I showed, um, I somehow had a connection, I can't remember who exactly, to the Broad Institute, which is how I got connected to Goopy, who was an artist in residence there. And um, so we had that conversation, and um, then the next one was actually Alan Lightman and Felice Frankel. And I, my idea was to do it at a bar, you know, that we would have drinks and kind of just really casual. But when we started putting the word out <coughs> for Alan Lightman and Felice Frankel, about 40 people RSVP'd in like two minutes. So we needed a bigger space. Anyway, that led me to the Broad Institute. And, and that's how this kind of all happened. It was like one thing after the other. And I don't know for you if it was the same, but I was open, it was the right moment to like do that. Because mm. I think otherwise you wouldn't have the <coughs> wherewithal or the energy that it takes to, to get this going. So let's a long, <coughs> uh, coffee yet. A long um, <coughs> answer. Um, give me a second and I'll pick up on it. Okay. <laughs> um, ah, sorry. Um, can you answer another question? Yes, yeah, sure. I'll keep talking. Um, Wait, give me a second. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, okay. Yeah, go. You asked me what? You asked me to talk. How you got started. How I got started. Yes. Well, we talked about that, right? A little bit? A little bit. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we can talk about. Um, sorry. We can talk about how, when you were talking about how, <coughs> having a mentor. I didn't have a mentor, but um, things snowballed. So one thing hap after another happened. And then um, I started to learn how you had to find the people to help you. So, oh, uh, oh no, I have something. Thank you very much. I don't have COVID, though, because I tested before I came. So, <laughs> so if you're, the cough is upsetting to anyone. Um, anyway, uh, when, as we also, because we were talking about startups, um, we, we, at a certain point, things snowballed so much that I realized we needed to, to become a nonprofit. And I don't know if you've, any of you have gone to the process, but we, I called, um, I looked around and, and found out there was volunteer lawyers for the arts and went through that whole process, which I don't think you've gone through, right? Yeah, yeah, no. Oh, we you have. have, okay. Yeah, we, we're a nonprofit as well, 2018, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a huge amount of work to be able to, just to go through the process, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like writing grants, which yeah. I'm sure all of you are familiar with, so. Yeah. Um, one of the things um, that I've been thinking about is this, what I call a kind of paradigm shift. Someone is bringing you water. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. you as well. And thank you. Thank you. I forgot to do this. Um, is this kind of paradigm shift that uh, I've noticed for both artists and scientists more interested in kind of coming up with solutions to our big problems? Mm. And I think. Um, that certainly happened in our programming where, you know, we're talking about, you know, uh, what's happening to the landscape, you know, with uh, Taylor uh, Perron, or um, the program we did with uh, uh, Pinsky and Stefan Hamreich, 
um, that happened to be the day that t Trump pulled us out of the Paris Agreement. And it was, you know, people really, they wanted, they wanted Robert Pinsley to come up with like solutions to this problem <laughs> of the oceans, you know, being polluted and so on. Um, so, you know, I think either directly or indirectly, um, there is this, I think, need for people to come up with solutions to problems and hence social practice. Yeah. No, we had the same, uh, something similar. When COVID hit, I panicked because, okay, first of all, everyone panicked because it's COVID, but at the same time, I panicked because transcultural exchange is all about international exchange. So what are we going to do? You know, all, everything we do is like, and, and it's about letting people know about different rural cultures. So I was really like, uh, we, we, do we just like stop now? And then I realized that I was crazy because we've done things. I mean, with the, the tile project, the coaster project, we had, you know, we, I couldn't fly around the world and tell, uh, invite all these artists. I had to use the internet. So I thought, we've been doing this all along. I don't know, how, I don't know 90 percent of the people I write and ask them to please be a speaker, to please participate, are the people who ask me, can I please participate? So I thought, I'm just going to do the same thing we do with the Tile Project. I got out um, just a, a magazine. I, I went to all these artists' residencies. I looked up emails. I spent hours and hours and hours writing thousands of artists saying, you know, look, COVID happened. Let's all come together. Can you just send me an artwork, and I'll make a web page for you, and we'll make a website where you could, with all of you on it, letting people know that you care about people and you wanted to share your artwork. And so we were, you know, a problem comes, and you, you know, just feel such a desire that somehow you figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so for me, this is just an aside. Um, I don't have a science background at all. I have an art background. But you know, I have a certain amount of curiosity, which you need. Both artists and scientists are defined by curiosity. And so I, I have learned so much from doing this about all kinds of science, and also all kinds of artists. Because um, you know, I, I have a very specific way of working, different from the artists that I invite. And so um, I think that's been you know, just the most kind of positive thing for me about doing this, which Although I'm working really hard, like all the time, <laughs> I gain so much from from that output. You know that it it comes back. You know it feeds you. It it feeds me. Um, I also want to mention to our audience that you and I have both been have both partaken in each other's uh, yes. organizations. So I've presented and uh, done portfolio reviews, and Mary uh, did a catalyst mm -hmm. with your then um, collaborator. Mm -hmm. Do you want to show that, or? Yeah, well, I, I'll actually, if you would like, I'll show a short piece. I think you have to put the sound together. And it's a, it's a newer piece. Um, yeah. Will it play with sound? So you can, uh, I don't know, how, how many, are people in the audience science that this is? Is anyone? Yeah? Oh, cool. OK, uh, then I'll, this is actually more mechanical. Is anyone mechanical or an engineer? I think this is the one he said to replace this. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, we need um. Would you, uh, this is for sound. And, um, and Aiden said H HDMI should have sound. So okay, so let's try. Maybe we can add this in. But Deborah, where did you put my video? Uh, it should be right. Ah, uh, here. Here. This is a little entertainment interlude. <laughs> <laughs> so. The sound works. And yeah. Mm. We should have sound. You don't need this part. Oh. Here we go. Yes. No, the sound is going from here. Is there? I can make it louder. Can you hear it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it would be nice if I move this. <laughs> Thank you. 
And then it closes up. Oh, well, so hopefully we can, it's like poetry. Well, beautiful. Um, uh, so <clears throat> I had, uh, for Deb's talk, I spoke to, I wanted to, I had been making paintings, traditional paintings, so actually working with Transcultural Exchange, I started to think about, um, you know, I started to become a little bit more aware and thinking about a, a painting. Does it have to be something that hangs on a wall? I stretched them across rooms. I put them on, on pedestals. I made an updated Baroque sky that flipped to day to night. And then at some point, I wanted to hear what a painting sounded like. And I worked with an acoustic person who actually audified the surface of the painting. And we did a piece. And then I continued to work with people. So that piece, the sound that you heard from it, is, that's not a soundtrack. It's actually the piece is playing that piece through a transducer, which is the lid, which was on the side that goes on top. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's like watching poetry. Well. <laughs> and how did it work with you? How, did the, how has science influenced your work? Well, not directly. Not directly. I would say that I, my studio practice is one of tremendous privacy. So, you know, most artists work, you know, pri um, alone. And doing a catalyst is just the opposite. You have to be much, you know, outward. So I think I kind of protect my studio practice because it's so private. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, maybe, uh, do you think, of, I have a way I think about transcultural exchange, and maybe it's similar, that um, obviously, you know, well, not obviously, but I don't have lots of funds, or so I can't contribute a lot to the world in terms of donations. But I can do something which is put artists together. And I think that has made, as the woman said at the end, the world feels small. Yeah. And I think that what you're doing is very similar. Yeah, and I, it, I, I think this is something that... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, actually, for me, I mean, I'd say making my own artwork and, you know, sort of the imperative of being in the studio, it's really just the relationship with myself. Mm -hmm. And doing Catalyst Conversations, I, I feel like I'm able to give something back, you know, literally. And that um, this, I, I mean, I hear it all the time from both artists and scientists, this, like, need to heal or fix or find a, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I feel like this is my very modest contribution to that. Well, it's not so modest. Right. Well, it feels, you know, I'm not curing cancer, but, um, you know, I'm providing or cr creating an, an atmosphere for people to be in dialogue with each other, mm -hmm. which um, is a really important thing to, to, to be and to do, like always. And you could say in our kind of political climate that's less and less... Um, Happening, so. But maybe, Deborah, also, I mean, as I'm sure all of you know, ideas come to you when you least suspect it. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm, I'll be working on something and then I'll walk away and make coffee or something, and then ah, the solution comes. So, yeah. you know, maybe you provide avenues for maybe. these moments. I also <laughs> um, would be, want to share this with you, which is sometimes I dream phrases, I dream words, and the poetry in the ocean was something I dreamt. And I got up, you know, I like woke up like, oh my God, that's such a great idea. I'm going to use it. And I got in touch with Robert Pinsky, who I had a kind of connection to, and he said yes. Um, and then we found uh, Stephen Helmreich is an anthropologist who studies people who study the ocean. And so I, that, you know, they didn't know each other at all. But um, anyway, sometimes that's another way of getting kind of inspired. Mm. So I'd say that I have, you know, I have really interesting things that I'm doing in the studio, but it's not, it doesn't come out of Catalyst. You know, maybe it's a, a parallel uh, in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that I have high expectations of myself and other people. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe since we're, since we're the odd people in this Catalyst, in this uh, Venture Cafe, mm -hmm. we could find out what people, why they came to hear the talk yeah. and what they do. Yeah, that'd be great. Anybody, yeah. <coughs> I, uh, or, I, I and or questions. Oh, and questions. <laughs> well, I, I just um, I, I recently uh, bought some art. Mm -hmm. Cool. I watched I watched this uh, documentary. I don't remember what platform it was on, but it was called um, uh, "The Price of Everything and the Value of Nothing." Some oh. in that phrase. But basically, it starts out talking that you know art gains value when people actually pay for it, and mm. that gives you know that's what that's 
essentially how we preserve art as a society is that we assign it value, mm -hmm. and then the more people kind of value it, and the more they pay for it, the more we preserve that art. And so I'm just curious, like, where does the funding for all, all of these come from? All these from? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, these, these are crazy, you know, and I'm sure, it, you know, not only your time, which I'm sure it takes a lot of, uh, but also like the logistics of like getting all this together. How does that happen? That's a great question. So um, I've been doing, you know, over 10 years. Um, basically, uh, it's a volunteer on my part. I do other things to earn a living. Um, sometimes we get grants. You know, that's one of the reasons to become a nonprofit is you can apply for grants. Um, I have other people who volunteer. We have a board. Um, but basically, um, yeah, it's not, it's not a financially uh, rewarding. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, making art, I mean, I wouldn't do this in order to, you know, in order to make money. But, yeah, I mean, that's my short answer. I'll, I'll answer both questions. First, I saw that show and I really liked it. Um, uh, and one thing I have to say about that is that um, that show talks about you know the value you give to things and some things last value over time. But you know there are some things and Van Gogh is always the big example that is devalued in its time and no one pays attention to. Mm -hmm. And Vermeer is another one. You know there's a huge show in Holland now, and it, it's completely sold out. Vermeer you know didn't. It was unknown for about a hundred years before people rediscover yeah, them. Yeah. So I think to, to, to think about art in terms of value is maybe a little bit tri tricky because you know you could hold on to a mirror for a hundred years and then you're like you know a million million bazillionaire, right? Um, and then how we how we function. Um, uh, we, <laughs> we, we, I, I uh, beg a lot of people and a lot of good people believe in helping. And so they help, you know, like when I did the first project with, um, the v, you know, Vienna, I said yes to my friends from Vienna, and I'm like, I don't, I don't have an exit, I don't have a gallery. And we, like, talked to people in the neighborhood. Someone knew, someone who knew the old Ludwig drum factory, which was Ringo Starr's drums. They let us, they said, oh, you can just use the space, you know, just clean it up afterwards, because they were going to tear it down and make it condos. That got done. Then we needed a catalog. I wrote some magazine and ask if we could put images in. And they said, ah, oh, sure, you know, put some images in. Then I decided we needed someone famous, you know, so that people would pay attention to us. So I wrote Vim Vendors, the filmmaker who did Wings of Desire, and I said, you know, you have this film script that's called Reverse Angle, which happens to be the name of our show, which happened then become our name of our show. Could you let, let us use your film script? You know, and, and, you know, of course, we had no money to pay him reprint. And he said, yeah, sure, you know, so we did. And we just, like, this continuously happens. Because it was, the, it was the right moment for this to be Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. But I think also, you know, you really want to do it. You just go and say, you know, I really want to do something. Someone's going to hear it, you know? And the, luckily, you know, our projects have not been the Coaster Project. You know, people sent me a box. Cost them maybe $20. We sent it back. We did the whole project for under $4,000. Um, then we, um, for the tile project, I thought, we'll get like 20, 10 places around the world to do this, and I'll do something. I'll raise $10,000 somehow. I'll do it. And I'll send an artist from one place to the other place. 20 artists said yes. Then we incorporated. I started writing grants, got a board together, and people have just been kind and helpful. Right. So, I mean, yeah, excuse me, I was just going to say, um, you know, all of that, you know, especially for becoming a nonprofit, was like, I had never done anything like this. So, you know, learning as we go, you know, high, I'd say, high, high bar to make this all happen for us. So I think if you, if you really want something bad enough, you find a way, you know. And, and unfortunately, I want lots of things bad enough, <laughs> you know. Um, so anyway, um, that's, uh, so we're not making a fortune. But I'm, I, I, I do not have any regrets. I would not change my life for one minute. Yeah. I've had a very exciting life, I think. I mean, I've seen dervishes in Sarajevo, you know? I, you know, I, I just think that this is kind of marvelous, you know? Mm. So. Can you talk about how you balance your time as an artist with your organizations? Like, <laughs> yes. Um, Not well. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? I, I was just saying that as an artist, it's always hard to mm. carve out <laughs> it's quite a demanding work. So do you give yourself like schedules? Do you say 20% of my time is art making, 80% like 
Can you just talk a little bit about how you balance it all and like how much time you spend on the organization and like your own practice? Do you want to start? Uh, sure. So um, I have a very rigorous schedule, Monday through Sunday. Um, I do a couple of other things. I run the Suffolk University Gallery, so I'm a curator. And I also teach in a low residency graduate program. Um, and yeah, and my, own, and my own work, and Catalyst. So um, usually Monday through Thursday, I am at the gallery. But on either end of the day, I do about two hours of work for Catalyst. Fridays are like getting the laundry done and things like that, or, you know, or visits or whatever. You know. And then the weekend is for my work. So that's, that's, I keep it pretty structured. I don't have a lot of downtime, but um, you know, I'm still pretty jazzed about what, what we're doing. So yeah, and, uh, very structured. I'm the opposite. <laughs> I have no, I, you know, someone one time said, looked at my horoscope, I hate to admit it, but said, um, you know, you, routine is like not with you. You know, it's not part. And I would say, yeah, I can't even like, you know, when the doctor says, do you exercise? I look at them like, because you have to do that every week, right? Forget it. So I can't do anything like that. I just, uh, everything I'm putting out fires. We have a grant due. I sit there and I finish the grant. Then I go do my work, you know, and then I, then I get involved in my work. Two days go by and it's like, oh my God, I have to go teach. So I get in the car and I go teach. And then I come back and it's the same thing. It's like constant. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's okay. It's, 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 it's sometimes not completely enjoyable, but you know, the grant is necessary to get the enjoyable things. So, so I'm sorry, I really am not the person to ask. I just do the things that I, all the time until, you know, it's done. Yeah, it works. It works. <laughs> it, works. it works for you. Yeah. yeah. And I've been a disciplined kind of person since I've been three. I mean, this is, I mean, it's just, it's just like deep in the DNA and um, it's, it's how I function, so. Yeah. Um, so I teach public art and art activism and do all the stuff that you're talking oh, about. Oh, I'm so happy to hear. Oh, yeah. And it's your question is better than mine. Um, and how do you balance everything? And I'm here actually to hear from you guys at Deborah. Um, because he's so impressed with your longevity and your work and your <laughs> field. So I'm working with historic, I'm, I'm doing international projects working with men and women, old art women, mm. scientists and historians. So it's very interdisciplinary. And I am like burnt out with writing grants. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm also wondering about life after COVID and whether you've noticed yeah. some changes. I mean, I think that there was a kind of generosity in this country and, and now I don't feel like that's quite in place. Um, but it is all about conversation. So I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm heartened to be here and hear what you're saying and hear what the struggle is and that it's not a profitable kind of world. It's, it's really just being committed to your ideas and wanting to make them happen. Um, and wanting, and, and I guess working in Europe, I mean, working in Vienna has been very exciting because there's a very strong art program but now I'm working in Riga, and it's not quite the same. And so I'm interested in tapping what's going on in the US, because I think that, in fact, in Boston, this whole thing that you're doing, Deborah, is, is really exciting. Right. There's, there's also, if you're familiar with uh, Kate Gilbert's uh, Now and There, which is uh, devoted to public art in the Boston area. Yeah, you know that. Uh, you should definitely get in touch with her. Um, and, yes, yeah, Well. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> Did you have another one? Otherwise, I can. No, go ahead. Um, wh what I can suggest is also you might, you know, I told you we do these international conferences on opportunities in the arts, and we bring 150 speakers around the world, a min minimum. We have more. But um, you might want to propose to talk. Yeah. Definitely. So then you can introduce yourself to the people we know, and they're looking for partners all the time. And I, and I want to say that not all, I, sh I should point out, not all artwork, uh, not all artists are, um, you know, like me, and you know, well, you know, I make stuff that doesn't sell. But you know, there's. Um, uh, I was just in Taiwan, and there was an artist there who, who I've known since he was working. You know, same like us, blah blah. blah. He makes a hundred thousand dollars a painting now. You know, he's doing quite well. So it can happen. <laughs> um, and now he's starting a artist in residency program to give back. So it's it's lovely. So, I'm, and to address your issue about COVID, I do think that there was this kind of down period, but um, I. 
but it's coming back, you know. I, I, we did the conference we, in November. It was okay attended. Afterwards, I've had a deluge of people saying, you know, when you're going to do, do it again, I want to, you know, like, so it's, things are picking up again. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's just slow, but I think things are picking up again. And unfortunately, as you all know, different countries have different funding, you know. Right. The Venus did not have to have a dance party to raise the money to ship their work to Chicago. We did, you know. It's just mm -hmm. the reality. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? Yes. I have a question about like um, something in Kendall Square, you know, where Kendall Square is like they say it's like you know like, like seven million dollars in like a block or something like that. <laughs> Well, you know, well, I don't know how to answer this simply, but I feel like what we're, do what we're doing this evening is like demonstrating that we're at the table as well. You know, I mean, not in term it's not a value thing, but, you know, scientists or people in startups should know about art. They should know about the value of art and especially contemporary, you know, what contemporary artists are doing. And the, you know, I think a pretty thriving, interesting um, scene in Boston. You know, there's, I mean, that's kind of my whole, you know, whatever, <laughs> desire is that scientists should know how, how smart and interesting artists are, you know. And that, you know, we're, that this kind of dialogue is, is, you know, not only interesting, but, you know, really important. And in my conversations I've had with the CIC folks, for example, they're also really interested in broadening how, you know, what the researchers and startups are, are doing, you know, that it should, in, you know, impact them in a positive way, so. Um, yeah, we're almost at seven, so, um, yeah, uh, one more. I want to pick up on something that you said, Deborah. Um, you teach uh, at a university, some, some of us teach in wherever colleges Engineers and even um, research scientists are very interested in art. Yeah. And the opportunity to co teach with people in other disciplines gets students uh, aware yeah. of, of that interaction. So I, uh, I think that's fabulous. I think that, uh, you know, that's something that we should share with people. Yeah, colleagues. I think that we should ask them. For the, the hearing the painting, I asked doctors at MGH. They like said, sure, come over. Right. Right. You know, we forget that they're people too, and we just have to ask them. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so you know, maybe this, you know, these kind of talks. You know, it's maybe a seed. You know, yeah. I know in most universities, you know, that everyone is pretty siloed. You know, pretty separated, and we just, you know, you just have to kind of make it happen. Right. Basically, right. yeah. Like Mary said, yeah. you, you ask 